One of the issues that we've had around responsible sourcing in, in, in that lovely term of greenwashing, where, where you can literally predict the pictures, the terminology and the graphics that will come up in any annual report or any sustainability report. And it sometimes makes it difficult to understand since there is no benchmark for reporting, you have the GRI standard for reporting, but it's still sort of voluntary and people pick and choose which bits of the GRI reporting template they pick. Our next question basically goes towards seeing who's an actual successful reporter of sustainability practices as compared to the more general, we must save the planet kind of picture. Um, and Rebecca, I'm going to start with you there. Um, we have seen many schemes and Irma is, is increasingly being used and mentioned by third party because of its third party certification. What extent do you think Irma's success comes from its non-greenwashing credentials? And I'm going to throw in a little bit of a curveball there and say there is Irma, there's also the Responsible Business Alliance, and there are 500 other audit schemes out there. What do you think makes Irma a preferred choice, as we're seeing with a number of businesses? So I think this comes back to who is at the table and what is the authority that they have in governance. And so if you look at any scheme, I would look at who is governing the scheme. Is it an industry association um, or is there another set of actors who's governing the scheme? And in Irma, we do speak about multi-stakeholder governance. And I would just go a step further to emphasize what Stephanie emphasized, which is equal governing authority. So communities at the table have as much authority in governance of IRMA as the mining sector. And in terms of greenwashing, that is key. And the NGOs, communities, and labor sector representatives at IRMA's table really do hold the system to account to ensure that the governance of the system and what is in the standard itself, right? The standard being what mines are measured against in terms of assessing their performance that is very much governed equitably through by all of those stakeholders. So it's not simply that we ask civil society for their input or we ask them to review the standard. They are active governing um, members of the IRMA system and have equal weight in shepherding how it moves forward. So I would say really that equal governing authority, so going beyond multi-stakeholder. And then another, I'll just list some of the other components that I think are key, especially through different stakeholder perspectives. So the detailed requirements in IRMA, the rigorous requirements, and the idea that when you look at the standard, yes, it is 200 pages, but it's lengthy for a reason. So we don't simply say, have a stakeholder engagement plan. <clears throat> we lay out exactly what it means to have an effective stakeholder engagement plan and all of the different elements that need to be a part of that plan. That's key from an auditing perspective. So when an auditor comes in, they know exactly what they should be looking for. And it ensures that when they're looking at different mine sites, they see each of them and can, can look at them through an objective angle and really um, sort of more on a level playing field, right? To really say, do you have each of these components? Then other, another aspect of IRMA is that we do cover all mined materials like Stephanie spoke about. And from a purchasing perspective, that's really important. So if you think about your sustainability team that needs to look at the responsible sourcing of 40 different materials, for example, right? When we think about a car. And so if they can simply look to one certification system, understand all of the components of that system, they don't need to learn a different scheme for every material that they source from. So that's really key. Then you look, I already mentioned the fact that all of the topics are covered. That's really key from a mines perspective. And then you've got this transparent audit process. And Masuma, this really goes to your question of greenwashing. How do you ensure that this isn't just greenwashing? There's two aspects beyond this equal governing authority that are key to the audit process itself. So the audit process is transparent in that it is um, no, basically we publicly notice the audit before it actually happens. So those who are impacted can reach out to the auditors and say, we've got something to say. When you come and do the audit, please speak to us because we have something to say about this mine's performance. We being the communities, the NGOs, right? The in, those that are actually impacted by the mine, they, by the mine, 
they know in advance so they can be part of that on-site audit. The auditors not only take sort of those that have reached out to them, but they actively do outreach to really get that holistic perspective of a mine's performance. And then this other, this um, final point that I'll touch on is transparency and reporting. So you've got this transparent and inclusive audit process, and then the report that comes out from it actually goes through every single requirement, speaks to how online performs on each requirement, and lists the auditor rationale of why the mine received that score. And so when we talk about transparency, it really is, I would say, radical transparency for the sector to have a report of such rigor, of such detail, and a report that is publicly and freely available. You can simply go onto our website, find the PDF. We don't need a membership fee. We don't even need your email address. It is there and free for anyone to look at and to understand what is happening in the mining sector. Thank you for that, Rebecca, because this, this question of about reporting, and, and, and I'll come back to this, it's, it's about putting information out but like I said, one of our struggles as a project right now is too much information and how do you standardize it and use it, especially on the investor side where they like risk ratings and they just want a number. They just want a 3.9 or a 7 so they can plug it into their Excel sheet and they're good to go. Um, but let me come back to you in a minute on that one because, Olivier, again, um, your CEO had a motivation. You guys did something. Great. But we've talked about in other panels and in other research about the cost of responsible sourcing or the cost of sustainability. Um, you've developed this process, but how was this process then used as a communication tool for your clients, for your wider investor shareholders? And did it serve a business purpose apart from saying, look, we're, 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 we're being responsible, but was there a business angle or business consequences of your recycling approach that you found beneficial for the company as a whole? Okay, so yes, we didn't start with the business plan uh, with the recycling. So we start first, is it possible to do it? And, and, and the business plan came later on. And now we see a, a big change also uh, because customers likes this um, environmental process of batteries and they are, yes, they like to buying now a vehicle that they know exactly that the batteries at the end of the life will be recycled in a friendly way. So also with the second life of energy storage systems, um, people are, or customers are willing to pay at the same price as first life because they know they have the background of this environmental friendly use. So yes, it, Yes, it was a positive way. It was a positive way. But Olivia, do you think you guys are sort of leading this and the rest of the sector, the battery manufacturing sector is going to start catching up? Is that the way? Are you, is, is your, uh, okay, let me, let me ask it this way. Is your process IP protected? No, and no, no, exactly. We, we're thinking for changing something, we have to work together. And that's why we didn't uh, put any IPs on, on, on the recycling process. So working together, change the world, change the, all this, this kind of loop. And uh, we see that the, the raw material price increase and, and uh, companies now starts to be, they want to, to keep these materials in, in the loop, to reuse it again and then to work together. Yes, exactly. Okay, and do you guys at the end of the year uh, annual report also release information on how many were actually recycled, what your key performance indicators were, or is it just the annual report says we recycle our batteries? I'm asking, <laughs> is, is there data and yeah, information sure. behind um, what you guys I, do? I'm not writing these reports. <laughs> I will ask, I will ask, but uh, yeah, I will okay. give you the information. <laughs> That, that would be good to know, because like I said, I think for the, those of us who read these too many reports, it's like, oh, yeah, we recycled batteries, and it turns out somebody recycled two batteries at some yes. point. You're so, like, you yeah. Yeah, we are recycling four hours a week, more or less. Okay. Because we have this 1% of batteries that can be recycled, because we are trying this to put it in second life vehicles, to energy storage. So the amount that came really to the recycling is more or less four hours a week. Okay. 
the, I, I like the other part of your sentence saying they're going into second life and not being chucked directly into recycling. Um, Jesse, because of the kind of work that you guys do, I'm, I'm guessing you have to read a lot of reports and figure out what's actually going on and information. For those who do implement sustainability well, and those who report on doing sustainability well, do you see a common denominator about the kind of companies they are or whether they have legal requirements? What is the commonality between people who are doing this well? Mm -hmm. um, I get asked this question a lot and I feel sometimes I give a really disappointing answer because stakeholders feel it's really complicated. And so I'm going to give this really complex answer and actually it's reasonably um, straightforward. There are some really good early steps. And I think both Rebecca and Olivia touched on this, is that public and transparent reporting is what good companies are doing well. And the reason for that is that this reporting is not just these are the policies we have in place, Masuma, as you just kind of mentioned, but like this is how this policy is triggered. And this is what the next steps are. Um, we um, work across the whole value chain, as you mentioned, and another tool we have is the Renewable Energy and Human Rights Benchmark. To undertake that benchmark, we consult with 15 of the largest wind and solar producers. We take all their publicly available documents, we go through them, then we sit down with the company and say, okay, this is what we think, what do you think about what we've interpreted from this? Often the pushback we get is, oh, well, we have a policy on that, but it's not public. We have due diligence on this, but it's not public. And either that's an internal company policy, or as Olivia was just pointing out about, you know, having free information, it's proprietary information. And so they actually can't release it. And for us, that's a, it's a really difficult place to be in because we can't say you're doing something well just because you tell us. <laughs> and without knowing that, not just from a, you know, a, um, an NGO level, but on the ground communities, then we're not really sure if these are working. How can you say a policy is working if, you know, we can't see the implementation and the monitoring and evaluation of that? You know, I think if you look at something like grievance mechanisms, we don't want to just know you have a grievance mechanism. We want to know how it's triggered, who can access it, how has it been used before? Was it successful? Did did the person, you know, did that work for the community? Did it not? How have you changed this? Like all of those things are what good companies are doing because it shows how these policies are working in practice, but it also means for them, they can tweak this as it goes along. That didn't work. We know that doesn't work in the implementation. We've got to change this now. And it's a much more legitimate process of implementation because it's based on real life information rather than just having that kind of pretty document that says all the right words. I think the second thing, and it's, uh, you know, it's important, um, is there's companies that are also really aware of what's happening in the space around them. Mm -hmm. And whether that's like sort of really like international high level, you know, norms like the UN guiding principles, or, you know, EU mandatory human rights due diligence, which is coming in, companies that are across this, that are looking long term, whether or not this is a regulatory thing that's going to affect them, but how this is going to change the sector, those are also companies that are doing well. Because if, if they're thinking much broader than them, if they're thinking globally, then responsible sourcing is going to come along with it because we know that that takes a really needs a really holistic view. So those two things, I think, which are, you know, not easy, but really simple first steps for companies to look at. And that's where the, the good companies, that's what they have in common. What you're saying is interesting, and I think a lot of you use the word transparency. Um, some of the work we do is also with legal people. And the question was put to one general counsel for a mining company and was asked is, why don't you specifically state particular guidelines or even the UN human rights guidelines or whatever in your policy objectives? Why do you just say general human rights, whatever? And they said the lawyers wouldn't let us put it in. Because once it's in part of a company policy publicly available, it opens up the possibility of litigation for them. And we have seen mining companies being taken to court in the UK and in Canada for human rights abuses in, in African countries. And so I, I, this balance between civil society researchers, we like transparency. 
corporate lawyers do not like transparency because it opens up so, so many vestas. And sometimes I wonder if we're asking for transparency just for the sake of the word, or what does it actually serve? And so Matthias, I'm gonna bring that question to you, especially since you guys also work with policymakers and civil society, where there can be a lot of language, but the evidence that Jesse was talking about show us how that implementation is working. Do you think, the conversation on implementing responsible sourcing is very much still about standards and what the language says, or are people actually moving towards implementation toolkits? How do we get this done kind of thinking within those circles? I'm not, not, not sure if I can answer this comprehensively. <laughs> it's um, also listening to Chessie, I think uh, she probably even uh, would know more about that. But uh, just I think we, we had an interesting discussion last year in our in our World Resources Forum conference, and uh, it actually a very similar discussion like here. And it started with the with the wording of green mining, and um, and green mining, and uh, it, it was very clear from the beginning green mining is probably the, the wrong approach and that's still so i realize it's still about wording because there is no such thing probably like green mining it's just the wrong approach we have to acknowledge we have to accept that mining always has an impact no and um, we can mitigate this impact, but uh, there there will always be an impact. And it's not a bad thing as such, you know, that uh, that it has an impact because as long as 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 we want to to use our natural resources, we we are not getting around that. I mean, <laughs> otherwise, uh, that that will be a difficult task for society, you know. Um, so I think it starts there with with this kind of wording and also with acknowledging. Um, the, the other thing I think it's when it comes to transparency and also compare wording is that uh, we we need we need some kind of of level of comparison no and um, I'm just now picking out an example which uh, we uh, actually um, um, where, where we also had uh, participation of was the responsible mining foundation or the responsible mining index they were actually in this panel uh, and uh, maybe you heard the news they have to close uh, their the activities this is very unfortunate because this was kind of i mean not judging now if this was done correctly or not i mean i personally thought it was a very good initiative uh, but it's unfortunate that this kind of independence indexing of of the efforts of the industry cannot be funded anymore and that was my understanding was there was the main reason that for example independent independent um funds uh, um um they, they said, yeah, we, we don't want to spend too much on, on, on these topics because mining always has the connotation of a negative activity. And of course, that's too bad. I think that's still, that's about now, again, about wording and mindset. 